Hey guys, and welcome to Quality Shot. I'm super excited to be joined by Gil Gross, and it's becoming a little bit of a regular theme uh, preview and reviews for uh, Grand Slam tournaments. Uh, so the US Open has just concluded, and a fantastic tournament nonetheless as well on the women's and the men's side. It's been really exciting to win and get into both. Uh, Gil, how are you doing, mate? I'm great. It's uh, it's great to be back. <laughs> It is. It is. I'm. Uh, I'm sure all the subscribers. Uh, we always have a fantastic, I, get, I think, reception for you being on the channel. So uh, I'm yes. sure that will be reflected in the comments <laughs> as well. Uh, so this is for you guys. Uh, but yeah, please do remember to uh, like and subscribe to the channel. And also go over to Gil as well, uh, Gil Gross, and uh, of course like and uh, subscribe to his Monday Match Analysis channel. And of course he's had Steve Flink on recently. I was listening to that actually um, a few days back, and it's a fantastic video so go and check that out as well some great insight there as always and as always on uh, Gil's channel um right okay let's let's get started then so I guess let's start with the men's uh, because I feel like the women's was really exciting uh, and I kind of want to gloat a little bit later on the video as a Brit about Raducanu winning so uh, <laughs> we can start we can start with uh, Djokovic and and Medvedev I guess in the final and you know I heard a lot about you know you and Steve Fling recently were talking about the kind of matchup and and I think I've mentioned it uh, straight after that. I think it was almost a perfect storm for Djokovic uh, kind of against him in the sense that he had fatigue, having played a lot of a lot of long matches, losing a lot of first sets, wasn't really playing his top level, then had that five-setter against Zverev, which was a very long and kind of like arduous match, which, you know, was very seesaw. Uh, you know, I think, the level of fatigue, not just physically, but mentally, I think showed a little bit uh, towards the back end of Wimbledon and then it carried on through the Olympics and then into the US Open. And I felt like it all came to a head. The pressure, the fatigue, everything kept coming to a head and then also the crowd as well, maybe giving him the respect maybe he probably thought he deserved uh, towards, the, well, during that final, all came to a head in one moment where it was almost too much and overwhelming for someone who... Let's be honest. I mean, he's been one of the biggest mental giants the sport has probably ever seen. Um, but even for him, it proved to be too much. And I guess it's kind of reflective almost of the Serena Williams loss in the semifinals. But he went one step further to that final and then fell. Um, is is that kind of how you saw it as well? Or, or do you see it differently? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm pretty much all counts except for, yeah. for the crowd. I don't think – and we can we can talk – we can discuss that further. Yeah. but. Um, I don't think the crowd really being on on his side had a negative effect on him, uh, but I do think the the pressure was kind of what we were talking about coming into the tournament. Uh, this was always going to be hard. Uh, I, I thought that the pressure was a factor during his Wimbledon run, and he was able to win the matches anyway, despite I think what what he was dealing with a lot of tightness, um, and then. He had the the rough go in in Tokyo. It, it it always felt like okay. That the question is, Novak, will he be able to deal with the the weight of the occasion? And it, it, again, he has done that so so well in the last three four years that it was easy to back him anyway. It was also easy to say, well, maybe you know he's he's human and this is just too much. Uh, I think the reason why it was an emphatic no in the final was because he was also tired. Uh, so because of the all the four setters he played, ultimately the five setter in the semifinal, uh, just being on court for for uh, so many hours, five more hours than Medvedev coming into the final, that eliminated his ability to really overcome the nerves with just trusting his legs and putting balls back in court and trying to trying to work on his uh kind of his safety uh with his with his shot selection and just just basically what he normally does like what he did against Berrettini at Wimbledon what he did in that Wimbledon final that was not an offensive match by Novak he came to net he finished at net but he did not hit high risk ground strokes in that match and and at, at all really because he didn't need to and uh he didn't want to probably with with the tightness so he was too tired to really execute what he usually does when he's feeling nervous yeah agreed and i feel like there was a a big disparity between 
the Australian Open final when they met, where Djokovic hadn't played as many matches, uh, well, as many long matches, didn't have as much fatigue. And then, you know, Medvedev going into that, I feel like he, you know, people were saying he might win, etc. But Djokovic was serving so well throughout that tournament. In the final, he also served well in that Australian Open final. And then here in the US Open, I felt like the nerves did seep through, uh, especially with the serve as well at, at degrees. I mean, he served more double faults than I'm used to seeing him serve, which I thought was a bit nerves. Medvedev also did serve some, especially on match points. But on the whole, I thought he served pretty well. And like, especially in big points going up towards uh, com- being able to convert uh, the match points and championship points. I thought he did really, really well. Um, and then from the back of the court, I, I thought it was just the backhand to backhand rallies is something that maybe Jok- was a one matchup that I felt like Djokovic didn't really want to engage in or shouldn't be engaging in as much, um, but ended up getting sucked into it. And Medvedev was happy to just, you know, he'd only dropped one set throughout the whole tournament. So he was fresh, he had the legs, and he, he just seemed like he was, dare I say it, in a better physical condition, which is almost crazy to say because Djokovic has always been the person who is physically superior on the court. Um, I, I, I thought that was really telling. Medvedev had a much higher shot tolerance. He was willing to play longer rallies um, and therefore was was dominating the long rallies because what, what he was doing, I think, really well was also playing deep through the middle of the court, not giving Novak an opening into finishing the rally, uh, just extending. Cause he, he could sense that if I, if I extend the longer, I extend the point, the more it's going to favor me because, you know, he's clearly feeling the legs and I'm not, and I'm, I'm willing to go. I mean, Medvedev's shot tolerance is always incredible. What we've seen in the past when these two have played besides Australia, where they didn't play that many super long rallies, we've seen their, their ability to kind of keep the ball deep in the court, really consistent, play long rallies. We've seen those abilities clash, and the result are these really gruesome physical uh, passages of play. We didn't get that in this one. We didn't get in Australia for a different reason because Djokovic was uh, extremely aggressive trying to shorten points. And then in the serving front, you're right. Djokovic got outserved very thoroughly in this one. His first serve in percentage in the second and the third sets were not much above 50%. If that, he ended up 54% for the match. That, I think, has a lot to do with the legs and just how he was pushing off. Uh, and then the return, I also think, has a lot to do with the legs. Uh, Medvedev hitting his spots. And uh, in Australia, the serve was Medvedev's serve, which is absolutely elite, was neutralized almost completely. Um that's the thing that I'd be interested to see if they play again in Australia in 2022 is how many free points does Medvedev get? Is it going to be as few as the, that meeting in Australia? Is it going to be as many as the U.S. Open final we just saw? And that'll be the question. Yeah, that's a really good point. I guess that's uh, that will be one of the matchups to watch out for uh, come next year. Won't it? Australian Open. Uh, that'll be really intriguing to see if we do see that again. Um I mean, Djokovic, just to finish up on Djokovic and before we get on to Medvedev, obviously he was chasing history. And I think a lot of people, I think, unright, well, unjustly saying that, you know, it's a failure. Of course it's not a failure. He's won 27 out of 28 of his Grand Slam matches in the year. And the fact that he even managed to get to that point, a point which, to be fair, look, out of the big three, he's the only one to have had the opportunity to do it because they've, always lost at some point during the year before the U S open. So uh, they've won three in a year, but never given themselves that opportunity. So the fact that Djokovic managed to get there, get so close as well, I thought was a phenomenal, phenomenal attempt um, an effort from someone who's had an incredible year. I mean, winning three out of the four slams where, where honestly, I think apart from the Australian open where I thought he played some phenomenal tennis, I don't, and maybe, and actually to be fair to him, the French open against the dollar as well, they were definitely spurts where he wasn't playing his best tennis, but he still managed to win three out of the four slams, which is incredible to think about and shows the kind of level he's at at the moment and why he's so feared. You, that's how you need to do it. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna play your best all the time. Uh, nobody is, so it's a matter of coming through those matches and winning. And that's what Novak's been such a master at. It's because uh, 
he raises his level when he needs it. It doesn't drop in the crucial moments. It, it raises. That's the biggest key probably. Um, and he's just, he's able to kind of feel out a match and figure out what he needs to do and when he needs to uh, kind of go into lockdown mode. Yeah, I agree. I think I feel like as he's gotten older, he's realized that maybe he's got more limitations physically. So it's like expending energy and mentally and physically at the right moments, as you said, you know, those key moments. And it's definitely told throughout this year. So a phenomenal year for him. Obviously, didn't complete the Grand Slam, you know, the first person to do it since Rod Laver. But I think we've seen how hard it is. And I think it's an incredible year nonetheless. I wanted to yeah, ask you actually. I, I, I just before that, I would like to add. It was impressive to me that he made the final here because I yeah. really felt like there was a good chance that he wasn't going to be able to do that given the pressure. And if he if if it was really too much, um, again, I think in the final the legs played a big factor. I was impressed that he was able to get as far as he did. Uh, I thought that Zverev win was a really really great win by him. So not, not even just winning the first three, I think making the final in New York was impressive. That's something I'll remember. Obviously I, I, I was at a lot of his, of his matches and, uh, you know, to me, Novak's run, it was, it was remarkable. It was unforgettable. And I, I just second what you said. I uh, agreed. Agree. And it's funny because that semifinal, uh, when Zverev lost, he almost, uh, was so disappointed with himself like, as he was walking through the tunnel um, there was like it was almost there was almost something on his face that made me think he's thinking to himself this is a massive missed opportunity. Obviously, he didn't play the fifth set maybe as well as he would have liked after playing, you know, winning the fourth set as well. Uh, and I'd, I wonder if it was a case of like he was he was seeing that slight fatigue come through, which we then saw in the final, like the kind of Djokovic losing his legs a little bit, and maybe he thought, look, I haven't taken the opportunity at the right time. Um, and I haven't like capitalized as much as I could have. Um, I felt like that was also a bit of disappointment. But the fact that Djokovic came through that, um, where I thought personally, I think when we talked about it, I said Zverev was my pick because I just thought he had the kryptonite for Djokovic potentially uh, more than Medvedev. But it, it it told to be the other way, which I know you predicted before. I know you changed it after, but I'm going to stick with the one that you gave to me <laughs> uh, with Medvedev. And and obviously that was that was the way it went. But I thought that was a really really I kind of, I think it it definitely took a lot out of Djokovic in that semifinal. Yeah, uh, it definitely did, and I think Zverev was was disappointed because he's he's still searching for that big win at a major. It really hasn't come. Now, I mean, he he won the the semifinal in uh, in twenty twenty. Um, was it against PCB? Or was that the quarterfinal? Yeah. It was against That's, PCB. Yeah, right, PCB, right, right, right. Yeah. So you know, I mean that's a big stage late in the major, but it just, it was against uh, a player who he really does expect to beat. Um, he hasn't replicated. He's pulled off so many upsets in best of three, incredible um, number of them. Uh, he hasn't done it in best of five. So I think he's just, that's, that's building for him. That, that frustration is building for him. Yeah. I think it was, he hasn't beaten someone. Is it within the top 10 or top five? Yeah. yeah no, no top 10, no, no top 10 yeah. wins at, at majors. Which is a pretty like surprising fact given his totally. skill set. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, interesting to see if he can hopefully get over that next year. Um, and then Medvedev, I mean, the dead fish celebration, I think, kind of <laughs> summed up what Medvedev is all about. Doesn't really care what anyone else thinks. He's very, very unique, and I, I think he's personally he's really good for tennis. Um, he's just a very, he's a breath of fresh air, which we're going to touch upon, I'm sure, a lot when we come to the women's side. Um, but he is a breath of, breath of fresh air. Obviously, he's been around. This is his third Grand Slam final, and it was third time lucky for him as well. Um, number two in the world, and I think he now clearly justifies that. He's had a fantastic uh, hard court swing, and I think you know he's done really well in the last few years at the back end of the year when it's come to the North American um, hard, court, hard court swings. He's done really, really well. Obviously, making the final here once before. I mean, how impressive was he? Dropping one set... Um, I think notably had a, an easier run than Djokovic to the final, but it was clinical. I thought uh, as a clinical performance over the two weeks. Yeah, it absolutely was. I don't, and it, it didn't feel surprising either that that Medvedev was getting through these matches so easily. If you've followed his uh, his production early in hard court majors, U.S. Open twenty twenty, Australian Open twenty twenty one, the fact is he's become a player who absolutely doesn't just beat 
players in the early rounds of majors. And, and that's where you get, by the way, slams being the largest fields and the most seeds, right? With the 32 seeds uh, and the big draws, you the, the top seeds normally get some some competition now now they could get number 33 in the in the draw but it's just unlikely but uh, my point is medvedev doesn't just beat guys in the early rounds he absolutely obliterates them and this is just what he's been doing uh and i don't know that i don't know that this has been been noticed but but nobody is even getting four games on him uh, or five i should say in a in a set early in majors and that's really good that that reminds me of uh prime big three and I remember uh, going to Ash as a as a kid for these night sessions, and it was never a good match. It was never a good match with the big three. And and with the U.S. Open, we could get into this. There were so many good matches. Uh, it felt completely different. Every night was good. Every Ash session was good. It was, but but not for not because of Medvedev. Medvedev was pulling the prime big three, uh, six six two six three six one uh, kind of victories. And uh, it, it's a good sign. He's so incredible on on hard courts right now. Um, and it was only a matter of time be, before he was going to win the U.S. Open because he's won Canada. He's won Cincinnati. He's won Shanghai. He's won Paris. He's won the ATP uh, finals. It, it was going to happen uh, because he's just uh, – his skill set with, with the way he serves, the way he returns, the way he rallies, his depth, the quality of his backhand, um, his movement, his court coverage – it, it's such a incredible cocktail and it was always going to come together. And by the way, mentally how he closed out that match, Djokovic played a great return game at five, four, um, and really could have broken serve, played a good enough return game to break serve. And Medvedev was able to hold his nerve. And I don't think the play, the, the other players in his generation would have been able to do that. Yeah, I agree. Really well said. I think he's, I think he's won the most amount of hardcore matches in the last, I think it's two years, three years, something like that. Um, he's had a phenomenal uh, run on the hard courts and clearly becoming a dominant force on that surface. I mean, incredible run, as you said, and I agree with you. I don't think Zverev, uh, you know, sits a pass. If we, I guess those are the two that come to yeah. come to mind. Like, I don't think they're beating Djokovic uh, at that level, the level that Djokovic played in that final. Um, I don't think they're beating him in that final. Um, I think in those moments as well, like as you said, I don't know if they would be able to then hold serve when Djokovic has that fantastic return game. Um, and the other thing I thought was really interesting and mentally shows his his fortitude, I guess, is on the championship point, he served a double fault for the first one. The crowd was cheering, <laughs> which I thought was a bit harsh, but anyway. And um, and then he served another double fault and clean the nerves are there, but then he managed to get it done in the end, right? I mean, he still managed to get it done. He got broken and then, uh, you know, he was two breaks up, got broken back uh, for one of the breaks and then still had that break up, as he said, and managed to just seal the deal. And he just seems like someone who just takes it in his stride. He doesn't get too overruled by the occasion. I feel like it's... It's just all positive signs for him going forward. Um, and I'm really excited to see how he does it. He's got such a unique game. We've mentioned it before and you've mentioned it. You know, the fact that he was going deep down the middle with his very, very flat, low, uh, like, ground strokes. And the manager, sorry, the way he's able to get so deep in the court with those ground strokes is incredible. No one else can do it on tour. Um, it, I guess it, it's almost, but not quite like Del Potro back in the day uh, when he was doing it. But it's kind of different type of, uh, shot but still flat as well um and it's, it's just it's phenomenal to watch it's different and i think it's it's great and he doesn't have many chinks in his armor to be fair um the only thing that i might say is he doesn't come to net as much but he doesn't really need to when he's playing that well from the back of the court and serving that well and i'm sure that's something he'll add to his game um as well uh but i mean i know you obviously said that he was the favorite etc as well going into well you are sorry for you he was a favorite anyway um, Djokovic obviously a fantastic one. We've mentioned him as well. Um, to finish up on the men's side, actually, I just wanted to ask you a few questions on uh, some categories. And the first one was, uh, who do you think was a breakthrough player from the men's side? Well, uh, probably Alcaraz and Felix. Felix, I've never seen him so good mentally. I've never seen him hold his nerve so well and uh, come through big moments, making them not look like big moments especially against Tiafo in that match. I thought Francis played a, a really good match. And uh, Felix had plenty of opportunities to miss some key forehands or 
make a key double fault with everyone in the crowd rooting against him, prime time US Open. You know, I'm I'm sure someone someone like Felix knows it's on on TSN, it's it's the prime time programming. Like that's a pressure match. That there's no there's no uh, way around that. That is a pressure match for Felix and uh he was totally calm and came you know delivered whenever he needed to. Uh, and and that continued all the way through the semifinal. So mentally, miles better from Felix. And then Alcaraz, we just saw what he can do uh, because he's he's going to be very special. His movement is elite, and it it reminds me everything about the way he moves and his footwork uh, reminds me of the the big three probably more than any player that I've seen come up. Uh, I think that his return is going to be elite. He obviously hits very heavy off of both sides. Uh, now we'll see him develop the serve. Uh, we'll see him develop the consistency. Uh, but the, the athletic base that he has is the athletic base that you want in a player who's going to, to win slams. Uh, and that, that's all there is to it. I think the best athletes in the sport who, who have solid technique and, and a good well-rounded game, those are the players that, that ultimately do big things. Yeah, agreed. He's he's definitely got the minerals, hasn't he, in the base uh, to uh, definitely, I think, build upon it and and be a champion. But I guess we'll see how he how he develops. But for me, yeah, the breakthrough player. I was going to mention him, but I like to call him Baby Nadal. But I don't know if he likes that. He he did say that he models his game around Federer. So um, he doesn't yeah, like I, that. He doesn't like that. Yeah, he doesn't like he doesn't like it. I always say it again. Um, but yeah, he's he's modeled his game around uh, Federer. I guess to be fair, Dimitrov didn't like Baby Fed as well, so I probably should have known that no one's gonna like Baby Nadal. Um, yeah, modeled, modeled his game around Federer. I think he said after uh, when they were talking to him, and you can see that a little bit in the forehand. There's a little bit of Federer-esque um, to that forehand, and I know Sitspas said after that match, which was a, which was a phenomenal match, I thought, um, just as, as a spectacle anyway. I uh, said that look, I've haven't faced anyone who's hit the ball that hard, um, which I think kind of is a testament to how clean he hits the ball. The serve is an interesting one because he, at times he was hitting serves like one, three, five miles per hour, which was like, okay, this guy can serve a lot bigger than like the big three like Nadal and Djokovic could when they first came up. Uh, but I think, uh, as you mentioned, the, there's a lot of inconsistency with this serve and he, it when it's not firing, the speed drops quite significantly. And he struggles a little bit with the rhythm, so I'm sure that will come as well. But he's definitely an exciting prospect. Um, and then in terms of, I guess, in ter- for you, what would be your match of the tournament? On the men's? Yeah. Hmm. I'm... It, it was probably... So, so the problem is, because I was working the tournament and I was on the outer courts, um, Murray... Murray Tsitsipas, I I could not watch, and Tsitsipas Alcaraz, I could not watch. Um, I think that I think Rublev Tiafo was a phenomenal match. That was a really good five setter. The fifth set was a little bit disappointing, I'd say. Um, did, are there any candidates that that are in your mind, but besides those three? No, I think to to be fair, I mean. Those three are, are definitely up there, but I'm. Ha- you can tell me one that you watched, even if it's on the outer courts, because I think people okay. should know definitely. Because sometimes the best matches are not the ones with the bigger players. Sometimes it is the, the guys on right. the outer courts. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, um, environment-wise, uh, the Maxim Cressy upset win over Pablo Crane and Busta was pretty special. Um, Jack Sock taking out Bublik was pretty special in terms of the environment. Um, I'm trying to think on Armstrong. I spent a lot of time on Armstrong. Um, you know, you, you had the five setter between, no, that wasn't five sets. Uh, you had RBA taking out Kyrgios early on. That was maybe the first night. Um, just sifting through my brain. Yeah, but a lot of the best matches did seem to be on Ash, which was kind of uh which was kind of interesting. It's not usually like that. Sch- Schwartzman Van de Zanschkolp, that was a good match. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was good as well. Van de Zanschkolp, I mean, honorable mention to him as well because we're talking about breakthroughs and obviously wild card made the quarterfinals, 
not quite the Karatsev of the Australian Open when we made the semis, but still played pretty well. I'm the only guy to take a set off the champion in Medvedev. Yeah. So good for, I know Felix got close. He was 5-3 up in that second set. Probably should have taken it against Medvedev. And then who knows? It might be a, a lot of, a lot closer, that match. Uh, but ended up kind of, I guess, conceding in straight sets. He would have been a bit disappointed with that. But I thought, as you said, he was impressive definitely throughout the tournament overall. Um, and then kind of lastly... Uh, so we've said uh, breakthrough and also um, also your match of the tournament. What was your upset of the tournament? Hmm. It was probably. I mean, I, I would I would probably give it to. Uh, it's probably Alcaraz over Titi Pass, but if not, it would be. Uh, sorry to use the same match as Tiafo over Rublev. Uh, was a was a good upset. Um, you know, uh, the most the, the biggest shock to me was was PCB because I, I thought I thought he would go deep um, in, in the tournament. So so that was really surprising to me. Cressy's someone who's outside uh, the top 120. So so that was shocking to me. Cressy plays a, a style that is pretty pretty difficult to deal with when he's playing well. Two first serves forcing his way to net over and over again. Um, th those are the main ones that come to mind for me right now. Yeah, no, agreed. I think, was it Hatchinov uh, also fell really early, didn't he? The silver medalist, obviously, in the Olympics, and he fell really early, and it was uh, Lloyd Harris beat Shapovalov, which I thought was a, a, a... Even though Lloyd Harris has had a very good year, you know, Shapovalov goes into like, the favourite. So For sure. Uh, very, very interesting. But I agree with the Alcaraz, it's pass, definitely. And uh, I, I think TFO came to tournament in good form, but again, like not expected to do the business against Rublev. So uh, a very, very good win for him. Um, we switch our attention to the WTA side and the women's. And obviously, uh, I'll just reel off some of the stats just because I like doing it. Uh, and also because she's, no, not just because she's British, but just because it was, I thought, a phenomenal, I think tournament overall, not just because of Raducanu, but Fernandez. And I thought overall it was one of the best kind of women's uh, Grand Slam tournaments I've watched in a bit of time, just because of the freshness that I thought we saw from both those players, especially the kind of energy they were playing with. This no kind of no um, kind of freedom, I guess even this complete yeah. free energy that they had, smiles on their faces, just enjoying their tennis, and it wasn't. It didn't look like they were playing professional tennis at the highest level at all and that was what was so refreshing i think to see and that's what i think endeared them to a lot of people uh Radicano, of course the first qualifier to make a final and then also the first qualifier to win a grand slam and also the first qualifier to win a grand slam without dropping a set so uh, incredible feat from the 18 year old uh, also winning in a second grand slam as well which is a ridiculously uh just i mean it's incredible to think about um i think she just made it look easy. Uh, yes, didn't face anyone in the top 10, but still had to face Sakari, who has had a, a pretty good year, making the semifinals of the French and also Benchich, who won the gold medal. So I thought those are good wins. And then Fernandez had a ridiculously hard route to the final, beating Osaka, who has been dominant in the hard courts in the last few years uh, in three sets, then beat uh, Sabalenka as well in the semifinals, who's another top, top five player, and Svitolina, who won the bronze medal as well um all those in three sets and then kerber who's been in good form another lefty uh, in three sets as well so a lot of three set matches uh not like radicon where she didn't drop a set um, but i thought it was a very very impressive run from her uh, how, how did you see the tournament as a whole obviously radicon in the end winning that final but a lot of juice games as well could have i could have really gone either way uh depending on those juice games but how did you view it um, as a spectacle, the whole tournament for the women's? Well, I thought it was one of the best women's tournaments that I've ever seen. Um, I think you you sum it up extremely well with in terms of the the freedom that that you mentioned, because I think that we see sometimes young players, breakout stars, they they really do have a sense of not really feeling the pressure like a normal player would. It's great to watch. I mean, I think, I don't think it's uncommon. It, former players will talk about, well, when I was that young, I didn't really understand what I was doing. I didn't really know where I was and there weren't any pressures. I mean, Emma Raducanu was, uh, 
I mean, obviously Wimbledon was a, was a high profile moment for her, but like she was just taking high school exams, you know, a couple of weeks prior. Uh, so, so it's just, it's different. Once professional tennis is your life and you get concerned about certain other things and you realize how many chances am I going to get to be here? Or you have expectation for yourself. People have expectation for you. I think that's the key. You know, once you have these expectations, it's impossible to uh, to play with the kind of freedom, um, un- unfortunately impossible that that we saw. But that's why it was so incredible. And the way the, those two competed, you know, Radu Kanu with obviously the the pure joy and also just the awesome game, the the polish that she has on her game at her age, from both wings. The serve is a thing of beauty, um, and I love the technique on it as well. Obviously, she's a really good athlete. And then the way Layla competed in all of those matches, I mean, I thought she was going to lose to Kerber. Um, Svitolina was a 50-50 proposition, I think, towards the end there. That was my match of the tournament. I'll get ahead of your question, Faison. Uh, <laughs> on, on the women's side, that was, to me, the match of the tournament. That fernandez Fidelina match mm-hmm. was incredible to me. Um, it, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing to see. And I, I, I made a joke to someone – uh, before the final, I think it was in the quarter, so it was on like Tuesday or something. I, I said, "Ready for the Radu Kanu Fernandez final?" It's completely joking. It's not serious at all. It happened. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Well, I did the semi-final preview video. I actually went for Radu Kanu Fernandez, and I said in the video, though, I said this is going to be really left field. It probably won't happen, but I'm going to go for it. Uh, and obviously it came about and I was like, oh, I'm a genius, you know, when I was in the final street. I mean, I said it would happen, but it was almost like the fairy tale one, which I think everyone wanted to happen. Um, but obviously they had Sabalenka, uh, which was really, really tough, um, I thought, for Fernandez. And she was obviously the favorite in that fall. And Sakari, who, you know, uh, is, is very accomplished as well herself. So I was just thinking, surely it can't happen. Maybe one of them, but not both. But they managed to get through, which is which is fantastic. Um, I agree with you with Radicano. I mean, she seems to have power of both sides, uh, which is really impressive. Um, the serve as well is pretty polished, and I thought it was pretty fitting that she uh, won the championship with an ace out wide as well, which um, is interesting. She's probably really happy about it. Didn't have to play an extra ball uh, <laughs> and the nerves, given that she had a couple of championship points before that. Um, someone actually mentioned that she has some similarities maybe to a young Sharapova in the way that she plays. What do you think? I mean, how how do you see it? Is there, is there kind of any similarity in that or uh, any precedent in that? Because she seems to have quite a powerful round game. Maybe, maybe. Um, I don't know that she's as much as reliant on her power as Sharapova was. I see a lot of redirection from her. I think the way she changes direction with her forehand down the line, the timing really sticks out to me. I think she times that shot incredibly well. Um, the backhand is is a shot that that does have uh, a lot of juice on it and a lot of power. She takes the ball early, like Sharapova. So, and that's a key to her game, I, I believe. Um, I, I would think that maybe she could have more defense than Sharapova. I'm not positive about that at this point, but I think that that's a strong possibility as well. Uh, but obviously she wants to stay on top of the baseline and she wants to dictate and she can do it with her forehand and her backhand. She really doesn't care which side. Uh, so in that respect, yeah, she is a little bit like Maria. Yeah, I agree. And I think with Fernandez, uh, all, almost a little bit Kerber-esque in her forehand at times with the crouch forehand, which is really cool to see. And uh, you talked about direct, well, redirecting. Uh, I think she does that really well, finds these Great. really incredible angles, which is similar, I guess, to Sarko different player but in the angles that she finds i think is quite similar and i think both of them mentally were fantastic and maybe as you said it's because of the freedom but i thought in moments where they could have easily fallen when they'll breaks down in the final set or breaks down the first set you know they were double breaks down and fernandez coming back ridiculously uh, in that Svitolina match um and just a lot of the juice games as well i thought in big moments uh, if we take the final aside and just look at the rest of the tournament they did really really well to come through it and i thought that was uh, maybe a maturity beyond their years and as you said maybe that will change um, as expectation becomes higher for them um but i would think the mental aspect of it uh in terms of being able to battle through points 
Um, looks like they've got the minerals there for it. Do you, do you think that's uh, do you think that's right? I think so. I mean, I was really impressed with the fact that Layla was never satisfied. She never let the she never let the thought. Okay, well, I guess now my run is over. It's been a good run. She never let that seep in, and she definitely had opportunities to do so. You know, Radu Kanu was, of course, basically ahead at all times. Was always winning. So there was no reason for her to think that her run was over. But but with with the players that Fernandez had to face and how tight it got and and how many first sets she lost as well. She lost some first sets, uh, including against Osaka. Uh, now that was the kind of almost the start of the run, but she was down a set and Osaka served for that match. Um, she was never accepting of of being done. She fought really hard uh, at all times. Her body language was great. I mean, the, the prevailing image for me of the entire Open was is just Fernandez with her with her right fist straight up in the air uh, because it was kind of her signature celebration. We saw it so much because she was so fiery um, and so focused at all moments. Uh, now her box, I think, instills that in her. Her her trainer, um, what was there, the energy that he brought, the intensity that he brought was more than anything I've ever seen out of any coach. Uh, and obviously her father also was giving her advice that according to her kind of goes into what I'm saying, which is this is your first quarterfinal, make sure it's not your last and do not be satisfied. And that was so reflective. It just seems like she has a great team around her. Yeah, agreed. I feel like uh, she definitely does. And she would, the amount of smiling going on by Fernandez when she'd get a cheeky neck cord and she'd apologize, then she'd smile, like giggle away. And it was almost <laughs> like, so it's like, you know, when you're playing against a friend and like it just happens, and you're like, sorry, but you're kind of laughing a little bit and you're just enjoying it. And uh, that's what I thought was so incredible to see and watch. And of course, it's different. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Nadal fan. And he's very different. He's very stern and, you know, very uh, kind of stoic in the way that he plays. Um, but it's also nice to see that kind of contrast with these players as well coming through. Uh, do you think, obviously, it was a huge upset. And I think it's hard to describe to people who are maybe not so ingrained in the tennis world how much of a shock it was to have two unseeded players in the final of that age as well. Like, it's unheard of. The first, I mean, the youngest final since was in 1999, Serena Williams and... Uh, and wasn't Monica Seles. Martina Hingis. Okay. Martina Hingis and Serena Williams, sorry, the US Open. Um, so that was the, um, yeah, that was the last time we had a final that young. So, I mean, it was just, it was a phenomenal kind of uh, scene. Do we think, I mean, obviously it's early days. They've only played each other once in the pros. Uh, do we think it could be the start of a rivalry? Do you think we both players have the kind of the game uh, to develop and then go on and be relatively dominant on not just the hard courts, but overall on the surfaces. I don't think it's a given. Um, Radu, Radu Kanu, with the way she plays, it seems very sustainable. Just her her technique and and her talent and her uh, her ball striking. It doesn't seem like that's going to go away. So I think she'll always be talent wise um, at you know never at a deficit. Um, and then it's just going to be okay. Can she? Can she bring that to the table mentally? And that'll be the the next challenge when when she starts to again have expectations around her and begin to I, I guess mold into a contender and deal with the pressures of that. Um for for Fernandez, I think there are a little bit more questions about okay, is her game really as good as she was playing at the US Open? Um now and they're both so young, obviously both have a chance to continue to make major finals and, and win slams. But I just, given history, I think you need to be weary of it. There are a lot of players who have, especially and mostly on the women's side, who have, as really young players, made their first major finals or or even won majors, and they have not been able to, to, to keep it up over the long term. I think Layla will do it. I'm just saying, I, you know, there needs to be a little bit of caution, and uh, she needs to continue. It's just one tournament; it's just two weeks, and tennis is very long. Uh, so, so we have a lot more time to see exactly what Layla Fernandez can do, 
And uh, we, we shouldn't assume that that these two weeks are going to look like every two weeks. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I think for both players um, as well. And I think the consistency is going to be key to see how consistently they can play and keep up that level in other tournaments, uh, including like Masters tournaments, etc. as well. Interested to see if they, what tournaments they play throughout the uh, rest of the year, if they, even if they do, um, given it's been a kind of a roller coaster a uh, couple of weeks, but very, very intriguing. Uh, in terms of the uh, the rest of the field, I mean, Sabalenka, that was a big, big opportunity for her. She made the semifinals. There's no Barty, there's no Osaka. Barty came into, I think, one of the favorites. Obviously, hasn't won a hardcore Grand Slam yet, but uh, she was. She came into after winning Cincinnati, so uh, she was one of the big favorites. Osaka, you know, well publicized, obviously, about the struggle she's had mentally, and hopefully she comes back from that. She's taking a break, not playing uh, in the BMB uh, Paribas Open as well, so hopefully she comes back and uh, fully fit and kind of not just mentally but physically as well. Uh, but Sabalenka, I mean, she looked so disappointed in the press conference after she looked absolutely disinterested didn't want to be you could tell she was just so disappointed um what what do we think is she gonna bounce back from that she's had opportunities she made the semis of of, the, of wimbledon as well um against pliskova that was another opportunity to get to the final this was an even better opportunity i mean is she going to be able to do it is she going to be able to break it she, she will in my opinion i'm i'm pretty i'm pretty confident in that look baby steps she hadn't passed the fourth round until wimbledon and that was kind of the, the pressure and, and the weight on her. When are you going to pass the fourth round? Um, and she's done it twice now. She's made back-to-back semifinals. I don't think it helped her that she was such a big favorite on that occasion. And the fact that she was really the the only top elite player left in the draw. I don't think that did her any favors because with Sabalenka, she's had to battle the the downsides of, of feeling the pressure throughout her career. And she's learning how to deal with it a lot better. Uh, but but there's still work to be done in that area. And I just think it was not a good situation for her, the fact that she was the overwhelming favorite in the semifinal. Um, I, I, but it should help her moving forward. Just continuing to, to allow herself to get in these positions is going to be what's most important. And then uh, th- there will be there will be examples where, first of all, she'll get used to it. She'll get used to playing in these big matches and hopefully she doesn't have to lose too many before that happens because it can go the other way if you lose too many, but it's only two semifinals. You know, I could see people overreacting and, and kind of thinking that it was, it's going to really weigh on her mind. I don't think it will. I think she'll understand. She'll look back on, on 2021. Um, and she'll understand that she's made a big, you know, major steps here at the slams. And, uh, let's see, I think I think she wins the. I think she wins Indian Wells. Well, I like that early prediction from Gil. Yeah, you had to hear first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm mean, Barty as well. I mean, a little bit disappointing. She lost to Rogers, which I, I look it can happen to anyone. But yeah. obviously that helped Radicani quite a bit because she faced yeah. Rogers. She obviously had beaten Barty, but it's a different prospect, I think. Um, I mean, surely she'll be disappointed after the highs of Cincinnati. She's won at Roland Garros. She's won at Wimbledon as well now. It's just that hard-court slam. And a lot of people were saying after Wimbledon she could be the the girl with a sock obviously having you know, issues at the moment uh, with Barty being the person to potentially, I guess, uh, be at the top and leave a bit of a gap. But uh, a bit of an upset and a disappointment totally. this tournament. Yeah, it was weird. She didn't have it. It was one of those days. Um, you can't convince me that she's not the best player in women's tennis. I think she's a true number one. Uh, I really take her game over anyone else's. And uh, I think the hard court major will come. It, it was strange. I, I I missed most of that match as well. But uh, I, I did see some of it. And uh, it was a really, really bad day in the office. It was a totally, it was, it was an off day for her. Um, you know, the strains of, of not being able to go home all year and just being an Australian, that is something to to consider. I think that's been really hard. I don't think you can say that's why she lost because she's had so much success. But overall, I think it's a reason to look back on her season and uh, for her to be be very proud of, of what she accomplished because it was really difficult. She was on the road for months and months and months on end, really all summer without going home. I think that's a difficult thing. Um, and yes, yeah, she just had a bad day. Uh, 
it's uh it's amazing how consistent some of the 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 great players that we've seen from from Serena in her prime um to the to the big three on the men's side it's amazing that that didn't happen to them more often but really it's kind of normal and it it happens yeah agreed i think we're maybe too used to seeing these <laughs> uh, these people who are really the greatest of the, of their generations and potentially ever on the men's and women's side uh, with Serena and obviously these are the big three doing the business and doing it very very consistently so i think yeah um i think more kind of uh human uh human errors and human days uh, for these champions come into it and i think that's what we've seen with barty for sure um to i guess to finish up on then on the women's side uh, i'll ask you the same three questions uh what was your uh well who was your i guess breakthrough player and um, i guess radicani and fernandez are two easy I'd answers say um but yeah uh, i guess you can uh, you can tell me anyway yeah uh breakthrough player has to be emma raducanu um bless you <laughs> thank you um coming through qualifying bless not, you not again. thank you thank you um thank god for the mute button <laughs> um yeah, I mean, she, she you, you qualify, you win the title, you're the first ever to do that. I think that's one of the the really cool stories with her that that uh, could go under look because of her age. Yeah, you know, because most people the the headline was you know 18 year old wins, but I think the fact that she was a qualifier yeah. uh, is really awesome because that had never happened. Uh, that's really really cool. So definitely Radu Kanu tearing through the draw, just <laughs> obliterating it. By the way, she beats Sarah Saribas Tormo in the fourth round. Um, tough match up. Or, or the third round. I think, I, I think, I think it was the third, actually. I think you're right. Yeah. I think it was the, th that's when I took notice. Yeah. That was the point Same. where I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. Right. That's because when you're like, this is a good player she's playing against. And then the way yeah. she rips through it, you're like, Oh, hold on. She, it, it shows that she can beat, because when she got to Wimbledon and she lost to uh, Tomjanovic, you're like, okay, maybe that's one step too far. And she played someone of a similar ilk in three was tournament and she tore through and you're like, oh, hold on. There's, yeah. there's something about her. The, the, that scoreline should have gotten everyone's attention anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, what's what's the next one? And uh, the next one is uh, upset of the tournament. Upset. It, that is Shelby Rogers. I, it doesn't matter what she did the the round after. That that has yeah. to be Shelby Rogers. I mean, I don't think you know Layla almost diminished her upsets by continuing to pull them off. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, that's> true. <laughs> that's true. If she just beat in Osaka and got knocked out the next round, then you might be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might be the pick. But but no, she she screwed herself on that one. No, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's got to be it's got to be Shelby. Um, who's by the way, like one of the nicest players on tour, everybody adores her. So, uh, it was good to see that happen to, to her. Um, and the crowd was incredible as well. So yeah. I would have to go with that one, but, yeah, but you I'm... know, Osaka, uh, Osaka, by the way, um, just mentally in Cincinnati and in, in the open, the same thing happened to her where w when she started losing, she went very, very dark, very quickly. So, yeah. uh, she, she really wasn't right. Um, Great. mentally. Which, which obviously becomes evident when she says afterwards that she needs to take a break. Agreed. Agreed. And hopefully we see her back uh, uh, mentally 100% because I think the tour's be definitely better uh, with her in it, uh, fully yeah. capable for sure. But yeah, Shelby Rogers, after the, that interview, she was full of energy and definitely extremely likable. So well, that was a great post-match interview for sure. And uh, the last one is match of the tournament, which I think you mentioned. Yeah. I gave you my, my early pick there. Svitolina Fernandez. You know, the amazing thing, what I loved about that match is, first of all, for Svitolina, it meant a whole lot because she's still trying to go all the way and make a major final. And she has been, you know, she's a player who has, I, I think it's 16 WTA titles, um, a, a steadfast really in the top eight, always there, a uh, really awesome player, and just hasn't been able to make her first major final is lost in a couple of semis in 2019. So a lot on the line for her. She knew based on the draw that she had an opportunity, but for Fernandez, she had never been that far. She had never made her first major semifinal. And you just wondered who was going to handle the, the, the moment better. Who was the pressure going to really 
effect. And delightfully, the answer was for a lot of it, neither of them, because they played incredible tennis down the stretch there. Third set tie break. Layla was the better player. Um, but that the, the tension in that match and the quality that they ended up bringing was really, really great. Yeah, agreed. I mean, Fernandez was, I think she was a break or a double break up in this, the final set. And then Satina came back and then it was a tie break. And I'm thinking, whoa, what is going on here? And it was just, it yeah. was incredible. It was such a good match to watch. I was watch, watching with my family and uh, we were just like, whoa, this is, uh, yeah, this is fantastic. And it really was. It was a great spectacle uh, for sure. Um, thank you, Gil. I really appreciate you being on. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day. Uh, anything you want to touch upon before we wrap up? No, I think we we hit it all. It was a, a great open. It was uh, it was good to good to see the fans back, no doubt about it. And I think they really raised the level of play for uh, for everyone and made it a very special tournament. And uh, it was also a, a really fantastic tournament in the absence of uh, of, of Federer and Nadal. It was still a, yeah. a great event, which was uh, good to see and good for the sport. Agreed, one hundred percent. And then I guess before we wrap up, uh, a bit left off topic but who's your pick for the labor cup uh team europe i think team world can win the doubles but i can't see them winning any many singles matches unless chemistry is a factor because team world i think those guys genuinely like each other There's yeah, a lot they of, they're, they're friends um i don't think you can say that about team europe now they're all doesn't like medvedev and sispas doesn't like zverev and vice versa i think that's right i don't think they get along <laughs> so, yeah. now i think they'll pretend to get along but i don't think they get along and they um, doubles i don't think <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, it's weird, you know. M M Mateo is in his own world with Isla, which I would be too. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> it's like I don't. Oh gosh. I don't think they're really friends. So maybe the chemistry factor will even it out. But but Team Europe has all top ten players, and Team they World do. has no top ten players. So that kind of tells you all you need to know. Very true. Very true. Very well said. Uh, thank you, Gil, for being on as always. Really do appreciate it. Guys, if you haven't already, do check out uh, Gil Gross on YouTube and also on Twitter as well. It's Gil underscore Gross. Uh, very active on there. And of course, he's been doing uh, work for the Tennis Channel as well. So good luck, Gil, on that as well. Um, fantastic work. And uh, anything you want to promote before we wrap up? No, um, Gil Gross on YouTube, Monday Match Analysis on all podcast platforms. Uh, yeah, the, the Twitter you hit on at Gil underscore gross. Appreciate being on as always. It's a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> no, no. Pleasure's all mine, Gil. Thanks for being on, mate. Uh, guys, please stay safe and well. Make sure you like and subscribe to both channels. And uh, I'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much.